All right. Good morning, everyone. All right. It seems like we only got one pew that's awake today. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, that is awesome. And can I just say, I wish everybody at home could see Charlie's Goofy mask, because as I look out, it makes me happy to see Goofy. That came from your grandkids, didn't it, brother? I think it did. All right. So we've got some announcements for you. Uh, we have lots of services going on, lots of different ways for you to come and join us and worship with us. So first of all, tonight we are going to be live on Facebook at 6 p.m. for our Sunday evening Bible study. We are going through the book of 1 Corinthians. Tonight we are going to be uh, finishing up 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and then starting 1 Corinthians 14. So some very interesting stuff. Uh, also, for Sunday mornings, we have our Sunday school series that is underway right now, Experiencing God. If you would like to join that, you're very welcome. We meet here in the sanctuary from 9.30 to 10.30, and that class is also streamed over Zoom. So we do have a couple extra books, so if that's something you wanted to get into and you didn't pick up a book yet, please let me know, and we'll get you caught up. Uh, next, on Monday evenings, we have men's group at 7 p.m., we are going through the life of David. <clears throat> um, I think we might actually get through this before the two-year mark, so I'm excited about that. Um, yeah, we, we've got big stuff going. No, we, you're saying no? Listen, we, we can finish this by July. We can do it. No? Okay. Well, we are at a place where uh, David is now king over united Israel, and he had a little bit of his first hiccup as a leader where they decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem and had a little wobble on the cart and somebody died and David got a little excited dancing and had an argument with his wife. So uh, interesting stuff. Uh, next, on Wednesday evenings, we have our prayer meeting and Bible study. Hi, Coco. We have our prayer meeting and Bible study. Um, that's at 6.30. We meet here in the sanctuary. We also are live on Facebook if you'd like to join us there. Coming up this Friday, January 1st. That's Friday, right? Yes. yes, okay. This Friday, January 1st, our youth group is having their Christmas sweater, ugly Christmas sweater party. So that's going to be here at the church from 6 to 8 p.m. We invite all of our teens. That's everybody from 6th grade through 12th grade. So um, if you have completed 5th grade but have not graduated yet, that's your window. Uh, we ask you to wear an ugly Christmas sweater and or Christmas t-shirt, and we are going to be playing a bunch of games. We're inviting everybody to bring a uh, wrapped gift for a white elephant gift exchange, so that's $5 or left. Silly gifts or re-gifted gifts are very much encouraged, and we have lots of games and prizes going on for that. Um, we are trying to be very careful, so we are asking everybody to wear masks, and we are not going to be serving food or beverages at the, uh, at the event because, you know, COVID and all that. But we're still going to get together and have some fun. Uh, our food pantry. No, sorry, youth group. Oh, I missed it. Sorry, you did write it down. Annika wrote down everything this week, so I wouldn't miss it, but I skipped it. Uh, youth groups, Sunday nights, 7 p.m. on Google Meet. We are using the same link that we have for several weeks now. So if you have last week's link, it'll be the same one tonight. Tonight, we are starting a new series. We're going to be going through the book of Esther and seeing how God worked in a young woman's life when she got put into some pretty incredible circumstances. So uh, they're just finding out about this now, but I'm very excited about this new series. So you can join us there at 7. If you have not received the link and you would like to, please let me know. We'll make sure we get it out to you. And now we're going to talk about the pantry. So we've got some amazing things going on. And uh, just to say a special thank you, through some events that I'm going to say were orchestrated by God, we ended up being the beneficiary of the Save-A-Lot can drive. So our local Save-A-Lot, um, all all, when people checked out, you know, you can buy the bag of food and leave it in the bin, they gave all of that food to our pantry. So that's a thank you to Save-A-Lot. It's a really big thank you to Edgar for going and loading the whole truckload of food in the rain by himself, and then also to James, who helped unload all the food in the rain. <laughs> so thank you guys very much for your help. 
Um, we've been very blessed. A couple things that we can still use in the pantry, um, boxed macaroni and cheese and boxed mashed potatoes. Those are two things we can still use. But uh, God has been very gracious to us. Um, we, we are recovering very well from the Christmas distribution, and we're gearing up to have lots of food to give out. So if you would like to donate food, that's very much appreciated. If you'd like to make a financial donation, you can do that here at church in the offering basket, just mark it food pantry, or you can do that online through our, uh, through our PayPal, through our donation site. Um, but just thank you to everyone who's been working together. We're not through this yet. It's going to take a lot more work, but it's been amazing to see that as the need has increased, God's blessings have increased, and we have, we have not run out of food. We have been able to give lots of food to every person who's come to us, whether it was pantry day or in between. So if you have a need or you know someone who has a need, please connect with us. Our next food distribution day is on January 23rd. That's a Saturday. We will be distributing food from 8.30 in the morning to 11.30 in the morning. If you're not able to make it to that pickup, you need a delivery, you need some help, please contact us and we will do everything we can to try to help. So that is just a huge, huge praise for me. We also want to let you know that all of our services, our Wednesday evening Bible studies, our Sunday evening Bible studies, our morning worship, all these services are available on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search for Pennsville Nazarene, you can get in there and follow along with, if you want to catch up on the Bible study or if you missed a Sunday, everything is on there, worship included. And uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and I think that's all of our announcements. Did I miss any? Oh, good. We got the white slide. All right. We're going to begin our service in earnest now with a prayer for a uh, prayer for our offering and a call to worship. So please join me in prayer. Father God, we come to you in thanks. We thank you for this season, for this holiday that we are celebrating. Father, we thank you for the Advent wreath, Advent wreath lit up in front of us that reminds us of your hope and peace and joy and love and of course, in the middle of the Christ candle that reminds us of the gift of your Son. Father, thank you for these reminders. Thank you for these lights that shine in dark times and dark places. Thank you for the hope that you bring us. Father, we also thank you for the opportunity to come together and give. I pray that you would offer a blessing over the gifts that have come together today, um, your tithe and our offerings that are in this basket and online. Um, Father, we thank you for providing for this church. We thank you for allowing this church to have active and vital ministries in our community. And Father, I pray that you would help us to continue doing that. Help us to be good stewards of all the resources you've given us, of, of our finances, our building, our people. Father, help us to serve you with all that we do and help us to show love to all who need it. Father, I pray that you would be with us as we begin this service. I pray that you would open our hearts to you that you would open our minds to you, that you would help us to worship you without hindrance, to lay aside fears and doubts and worries and all that baggage that we carry around sometimes. Father, let this be a place where we can lay that down and lift our arms up to you in worship. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray, amen. amen. So you will notice today we have a theme in all of our worship songs of Jesus as the foundation of our lives. So we're going to start our worship today by singing Cornerstone. Good morning. Please stand if you're able as we sing Cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord. standing as we sing Run to the Father. a burden for too long on my own I wasn't created to bear it alone I hear your invitation to let it all go I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 you saw my condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart and i don't have a context for that kind of love i don't understand i can't comprehend all I know is I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. 
virgin. My soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 it's been in your sight long before my first breath, running into your arms is running to life from death. I feel this rush deep in my chest. Your mercy is calling out. Just as I am, you pull me in. And I know I need you now. Run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again. I'll run to the Father. I'll fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. And my heart found a surgeon. My soul found a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 again and again. You may be seated for the scripture reading. Amen. You might recognize the scripture reading. We did it not too long ago, but if you received the district devotional that we mailed out yesterday, this was the devotional text for the week, and I just felt like it was God's message for us today. The Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. Mm. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongues from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from the evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memories from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous, not one of them is broken. Calamity will surely destroy the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Amen. Thank you very much. I know that was a little bit longer than we usually do. That was the entirety of Psalm 34. But man, it is good. It is good to know that God is with us, that we can experience his love, 
that we can tell about it. That's, that's why we gather together, right? So we can share our testimony, be witnesses, so that we can let people know that if you taste and see, you will find that God is good. So we're going to continue our worship now by singing King of Kings. Yes, please stand if you're able. Uh, this song reminds us exactly of that hope. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation to dis not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for your sake, you died. that you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you once again for this day, and as we come together, we lift our hearts to you. Father, we begin with a praise for a mother who cried out in help and received that help for 
miraculous healing and care, Father. We thank you for answers to your prayer. Father, we thank you for Carol's friends who have recovered from COVID and are well enough to be back at work, Father. Thank you for all that you've done. Father, we lift up Steve's co-workers to you who are struggling right now for um, this gentleman whose granddaughter has had seizures and is in intensive care. Father, we lift up this young woman and we pray that you would be with her, that you would offer your healing hand to her, that you would care for her, that you would love her. Father, we lift up this other friend of the Brechts who has had surgery for cancer and is dealing with extreme pain. Father, we pray that you would help her to fully recover from her procedure, that she would not just be free of the cancer, but that she would be free of the side effects that she's dealing with now as well. Father, we lift up those of our friends and family who are dealing with this virus right now, often in unknown circumstances, wondering um, when tests might happen or what those results might be. Um, Father, please be with us in this season. We're dealing with a different way of living, a, a way of, of social distancing and isolation and quarantine and words that we're just not used to using, um, even though we've been in, going through this for quite a while now, Father. It's still hard to get used to. And uh, I guess I'm saying, help us not get used to it. Father, we pray for recovery, a full recovery for not just our nation, but the world. We pray that as these vaccines are distributed, that they would be effective. We pray for our healthcare workers who are offering care for our first responders driving the ambulances and answering the 911 calls. Um, Father, help us to draw together. Help us to draw together in your name and be your children. Help us to care for one another, Father. Father God, I lift up praise to you for your provision for the pantry. Father, we thank you that even as the need has grown, your blessing has grown even greater and that we have not fallen short. Father, thank you. Thank you for pouring out your favor on that ministry and we pray that you would continue to do so, Father. Help us to be positive agents of change in this world. Father, we thank you for this holiday that we are in the midst of celebrating, this Christmas holiday. Father, thank you for the time to take a pause, to look at our lives, to look at the world, and to see the difference, to see the difference between who you are and what we see, to recognize that our hope is not in this world, but in you. Father, thank you for the light that shines in the darkness. Help us to hold it high and help us to spread it. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. So today is kind of a, uh, I guess if you were working out in the gym, today would be the recovery day, right? That we've, uh, we've gotten through the holidays. Anybody feel a little bit wiped out right now? Sorry, I'm having a wardrobe malfunction. Um, yeah, we, uh, sorry, I'm all slid around and messed up. You know, the holidays... They can be wonderful. Um, do you ever feel like sometimes those days off end up being uh, a little more trouble than they're good for? <laughs> uh, sometimes we end up having more work left over when we're done. You know, we've got all the stuff that goes into the planning and the preparation. We have the anticipation and the excitement. You know, we have all this preparation of gifts and meals and special services and making sure we don't run out of candles. Um, you might notice that the purple ones are getting a little low, so we just squeaked it in on that one. So thank you, Jesus. <laughs> um, then we have the celebration of the day, the, the Christmas morning where we wake up and celebrate. I know it gets a little bit different when we're older, but uh, you little ones, how did you feel when you woke up on Christmas Day? What did you think? Were you like, eh, I'm just going to go back to bed? Or were you excited on Christmas morning? I got some thumbs up, Yeah. Double thumbs up. Okay, okay. They're uncharacteristically quiet today. Yeah, okay. Uh, the train's getting repossessed. Is that, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes when you're a kid, I don't want to say that we're naive. I think we're free of some baggage, right? I think children 
hear me out here, I think children are a little bit like dogs. Um, in that, <laughs> you ever notice that uh, dogs don't dwell in the past? They don't really worry about the future. They just kind of live in the moment. Like, you can give them the same bowl of food that they've had every day for 10 years, and it's, wow, I got dinner, right? Or you can walk outside for five minutes and come in, and it's like you've been gone for 20 years, and they just found you again, right? They live in the moment. They celebrate the moment. And, and I think maybe kids do that a little bit too, right? When it's Christmas Day, they're not worried about the, the homework projects that aren't done yet, which i got to remind my kids to finish. Um, th- you know, they're not thinking about the credit card bill that's going to be coming in a month. They're just thinking about the moment, enjoying that moment. And it got me thinking about all the stuff that we let get in the way. You know, imagine if I sat there watching my kids open their presents, and I was just thinking about all the other stuff. Like, we started a new tradition in our house a little while ago. I used to try to record and take pictures of our kids. If you could have seen the first couple Christmases with our kids, you would have seen me with a still camera in one hand and a camcorder in the other trying to record video and take pictures at the same time. Um, This dates me a little technologically, but, you know... I think I got to the point where I realized I was so focused on trying to take pictures of what was happening that I felt like I missed the whole thing. It got done, and it was like I didn't even get to participate. So we started doing this thing where we just put the phone on record on the tripod in the corner and just let it roll, and we don't pay attention to where it's pointed or what's going on, and hopefully we catch some of what happened. Usually it's the dog eating wrapping paper, but, you know, good memories. I want to talk about that stuff today, the stuff that gets in the way, the things that silence our voices, the things that quench our spirit, the things that keep us from being who God has called us to be. Because as powerful as God is, God doesn't take our hearts by force. One of my favorite um, verses about Jesus comes from Revelation, that he stands at the door and he knocks. And if we open, he'll enter in and, and, eat, and eat with us. He'll join us. But that, that image of Jesus standing and knocking, he made the door. He can snap and it would be gone. He could kick it down with an army of angels. He could walk right through it. But he doesn't do those things. He stands and he knocks, waiting for us to answer, offering the invitation. So, The worries that crowd out our hope and the invitation that God offers. These are the contrasting ideas that we're talking about today. The light of Advent and the worries of the world and the whispers of our enemy that seep into our hearts sometimes. Today we're going to be going back to 1 John. We haven't been there in a while, but we are going to continue working our way through it. Maybe not as fast as the men's group is getting through 2 Samuel, but we'll get there. Um, 1 John chapter 5. Today we are going to be reading verses 6 through 12. And even though this takes us back to a book in the Bible that we had been studying, I think it speaks very closely to what we're talking about here at Christmas. Um, Not just what we see, but how we respond. So 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son, by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross, not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit, who is truth, confirms it with his testimony. So we have these three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his Son, all who believe the Son of God know in their hearts that, his, that this testimony is true. Those who do not believe this are actually calling God a liar because they do not believe what God has testified about His Son. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Amen. Amen. So, 
I had a little bit of time on, on the afternoon of Christmas Day, and you guys get a chance to rest a little bit. Nobody. Okay. You were all working hard all day. Okay. Um, I made a mistake, and I, uh, I chose to go on social media. Anybody ever make that mistake? <laughs> Every day. I guess that says something about us, huh? <clears throat> well, I had some time to kill, and I was looking for some interesting things, and I happened to come across the post. And uh, for the, the original post was somebody who was not a Christian, and they were talking about how, as a way to love their community, they were choosing to work on Christmas so that people who did celebrate Christmas um, didn't have to work on those days. This, this person happened to be a Muslim. And, of course, in the comments, and there's that old adage, you know, never read the comments. I read the comments. And in the comments, a bunch of people started arguing because some people were saying, well, he did miss celebrating Christmas because Muslims do recognize Jesus. We do worship Jesus. And I thought, I don't remember that part. So uh, I followed the conversation, and, and the, the woman who was trying to explain it said, well, yes, we do. We recognize that Jesus was a prophet and, and, a, and a man of God. We just don't recognize that he was the son of God. And, uh, of course, people are free to believe what they believe, and I think theologically she probably was correct in her painting of Jesus the way the Quran talks about him. But if you've read the words that Jesus says, that's not really what he has to say. Jesus doesn't just say he's a good guy. He says he's the son of God. Amen. And I thought, how sad is it that so many people believe that Jesus lived, believe that he spoke the words in the Bible, even believe that he performed miracles, and yet they don't believe that he's the son of God. Mm. It's like getting the most wonderful Christmas present in the world and, and letting it sit on a shelf. That, that almost believing. And, you know, the letter of 1 John and the Gospel of John, these, these parts of the Bible are grouped together in a genre they call Johannine literature, like the literature related to John. And there is a theme all throughout both the Gospel and the Epistles of John that are this contrast between a belief in your head and a faith that's lived out in your life. There are all these people in the Gospels, and here we're called out directly, who give an intellectual assertion that God exists, or in their head they recognize that Jesus is God or the Son, but that never connects to their faith. It never gets to their life. You know, the engine is revving, but the transmission is in park, right? The, the, the knowledge never translates to life. And th that's kind of where this starts, the revelation of Jesus. Because Jesus was revealed to us. Amen? Amen. That's what the Christmas story is about. Whether it's um, Mary you know, having a conversation with Gabriel, or Joseph having a dream, or the shepherds seeing a, a host of angels in the sky, or the wise men following a star. It's all these different people who in their unique ways, receive revelation from God. They receive news that the Messiah is coming or has come, and they want to go and see. It's like the song Amazing Grace, right? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You see that transition? I imagine for those wise men or those shepherds or Mary and Joseph, this event, this Christmas story was the watershed moment in their life. There was the time in their life before this event and there was the time in their life after this event and there was a drastic and significant change that happened. The revelation of Jesus understanding that the Messiah was born, seeing this baby that was the son of God, changed everything for these people changed everything. And, and that's what we read, right? When you and I, we are at a place in history where these things have happened. These things are written. These things are known. They're things for us to be remembered. 
statements about something that is concrete. And, you know, when we speak about this birth of Jesus, we do speak in the past tense. We do read words of things that have happened. Um, and, you know, with, with just a few exceptions, most of the events in the Bible are things that have already happened. They're things that we are hearing about and deciding whether we believe. That's kind of what this has been, right? Hearing the word and trying to figure out if we believe. There were some people in the Christmas story who heard the word but didn't really believe. I mean, I think of King Herod, right? Herod heard. He heard that the Messiah was born, but he didn't really believe the Messiah was the Savior of the world. He, he thought the Messiah was a threat to his authority, which I guess in reality was true because Herod wanted earthly authority. And so Herod responded to the news of Jesus' birth by trying to kill him. And he wasn't the only one. This past that's referenced, you know, as we go through the Old Testament and the prophecies about Jesus or the New Testament, the, the words of the gospel, the words of the apostles that tell us what they saw, these are people who, they're giving us an intimate narrative. They're telling us what it was like. When we read David talk about having a conversation with God, it's intimate. It's like reading his diary. When we hear the words of you know, Peter, who sometimes is so wise and so bold and so on, you know, like recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah, but also other times so horribly wrong, denying that he even knew Jesus. And yet these people were willing to put these words down, the ones that made them look good and the ones that made them look bad, because they needed us to know the truth. The whole story was so important that we needed to know it. I imagine that innkeeper felt a little bad later on for not letting Mary and Joseph have a room, right? But that's the story. It's what we're given. And, and in this passage that we read from 1 John, we talk about Jesus Christ being revealed to us. And one of the ways that it talks about Jesus being revealed to us is in verse 9. It's being revealed through human knowledge. That's kind of what we're talking about here, right? I didn't see that star. I didn't see Jesus in a nativity. I didn't see Mary riding on a donkey. I didn't see those shepherds running in from the fields. I, I didn't personally see those things with my own eyes. But we have these words written down. We have this testimony written down, and they give us this fundamental understanding, this, foundation, this foundational understanding, right? But again, Knowledge and experience, they have to connect for this to work. Experiencing God but not knowing who or what God is, it might leave us with an interesting story, but it's not going to be life-changing. Right? Imagine if Mary saw Gabriel and they didn't listen to the words he said. I, I, was, I was sitting in my room and this glowing dude came up. It was crazy. Pass me some hummus, right? If she didn't listen to the words and put them into action, the story doesn't work. You know, that can happen in our own testimonies. Have you ever had a time in your life where it was after you came to know Jesus, but yet you still had a spiritual dry spot? Yeah. A difficult time. Some people call them valleys. Some people call them desert places. Um, there was a a gentleman back in the day named St. John of the Cross, not, not the disciple John, but he was named after him. He talked about an experience he called the dark night of the soul. Have you ever heard that phrase? He talks about how a lot of people go through that. Most people in their faith go through a season like that, a season where, for whatever reason, we have a time where we don't feel God present with us. Knowledge and experience don't always connect. Sometimes we know that God is good. We know that God is real, but we don't feel him. It's tough. It's hard to put these pieces together. And this might sound a little confusing to you, but I think it's because it's a little bit hard. It's a little bit of a difficult journey. These kinds of revelation that we just talked about in 1 John chapter 5 are the human revelation and the divine revelation. Now, thankfully, we have a lot of this human revelation, more than they ever did, 
because we have access to the Bible, because we have all these ways to communicate, because we can freely speak, because you and I, because we live in a country where it's not illegal to talk about God, because we have Facebook and YouTube, you know, we can share in this information in ways that those people never could. We're talking about that in some of our other Bible studies. Um, on Sunday evenings, we're going through uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, and we're talking about that church and how they received the gospel and then how they tried to live the way God had led them to. And honestly, they didn't always do a great job. They made some mistakes along the way. On Monday nights, we're talking about the life of King David, and he's the same way. We read about some amazing victories and some amazing uh, portrayals of his faith, but also sometimes he's a knucklehead. Sometimes he forgets to pray and gets into trouble. Sometimes he chooses to sin and messes things up. On Sunday evenings with the teens, we uh, just finished talking about Elijah and Elisha and the way God spoke through them as prophets. And like I said earlier in the announcements, tonight we're starting the story of Esther, a time where a young woman hears from God through her uncle and through prayer. Um, on Wednesday nights, we're reading through the book of Acts and the description of what the first century church was, of hearing the, the gospel, of seeing the miracle of Pentecost, and then trying to put those pieces together. So these two kinds of revelation, the revelation from people, the things that we read in the Bible or things that people tell us, and the divine revelation, our personal experience of God, they come together to build a complete picture in us. They come together in this combination of faith and transformation. Now, maybe some of you were born like Mother Teresa, like a ninja of the faith ready to go. Maybe some of you are a little more like me and have uh, fallen on your face a few times along the way. Um, that's where it starts, though, right? You ever hear something incredulous and you want to find out, is that true? Like... Hey, Jill, is it true that a platypus has a little thorny thing on its heel and can sting you with venom? Jill has heard that too. I'm very, I'm very intrigued. I've never personally been stung by a platypus. I hope not to be, but I'm very interested. Right? Sometimes when we hear something, we've got to say, do you believe that? Do you ever have anybody ask you that about God? Maybe people don't ask you about a platypus. I have inquisitive children, so I've been asked about the platypus many times. But anybody ever ask you about your faith? Yeah? Do you believe that stuff? Why do you wear that cross? What's that book you're holding? You ever offer to pray and somebody says, what for? Hmm. I, I remember one particular time this happened, and I think I've shared this before. I'm getting old, so sometimes I share things more than once. I was in the hospital, and I was walking down the hallway holding my Bible in my hand, because, you know, a lot of times, most of the time, when I visit people in the hospital, I share Scripture with them. So I'm walking down the hallway holding my Bible, and somebody was standing there by a window, and they stopped me, and they said, what's in your hand? And I thought, oh, great, an opportunity to talk and witness. I said, this is my Bible. And he goes, do you actually read that thing? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I do, I do. And uh, I opened it up, and I showed him where my ribbon was and what I had just shared with the person. And, of course, if you peek in my Bible, most pages have, like, highlights and notes and things on them. Um, that kind of helps me remember what I'm doing. So I share these things with this guy, and he says, I don't think that's true. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, the Bible's just made by people, and they change it over the years to manipulate you, and it's, they're just trying to control you and take your money. And, and I was like... I said, you know, I, I've heard people say that before. I was trying to be polite because I didn't know this person. And I said, you know, I've heard that before, but I don't believe those things. I think it's true. And he said, how do you know? How do you know? And I said, well, at first I didn't. At first I didn't know. You know, at first I kind of believed because people told me it was true. If maybe you went to church as a little kid, that might be your experience. That at first you believed because somebody that you trusted said this is true, right? I first believed the Christmas story because my, my mother and my grandmother and my pastor and my Sunday school teacher told me this story, right? Because when I was a little kid, we would have a birthday party for Jesus, 
And it was just understood, well, this is Jesus' birthday, and we're celebrating, you know, it was just, it was received as it was given. But it didn't stay that way. You know, later on in my life, I reached a point, like you probably have, where you stop believing things because somebody has told you they're true, and you want to know for yourself. And that's kind of what I told this guy. I said, I believe that this is real and true because it has shown to be true in my life. I've read this book, and it has helped me. When I'm in trouble, I go to this book, and I feel better. When I'm lost, I go to this book, and I find my way. I believe that this is true, not because somebody told me or because I can check it in the Greek or the Hebrew. I believe this is true because it has shown to be powerful in my life. That's my testimony. And that's kind of the difference here, right? You know, it's almost like when I first read this passage in, in 1 John, at first it seems like he's talking about two different things, the, the human witness and the godly witness. But I don't think he's talking about two different things. I think he's talking about two different parts of the same thing. I think both of these, the, the, the revelation from humans and the revelation from God, I think they're both the ways that God speaks to us. So, so follow me here. Um, if you've ever studied history, you've probably heard the phrases primary source and secondary source. Does that ring a bell with anybody? I know my daughter had to do some writing about this. Yeah. So the big difference here is a primary source is somebody who actually saw it happen, right? I saw Edgar light those candles this morning, right? I'm a primary source. Now, I just told you that Edgar lit those candles, so maybe you weren't here when he did it, so you're a secondary source. Make sense? I actually saw it. You just heard me talk about it. Primary source, secondary source. That's why our stories are important. You know, if you hear a secondary source, oh, I heard somebody say that Edgar lit those candles. Can you trust that? Well, yeah, it depends on who's sharing, right? If you're three or four steps down the chain, all of a sudden, did you hear Edgar has a flamethrower? Right? The, the story gets a little funny, right? But if you hear it from the person who experienced it, that's a whole different thing. So for me, I take this passage as a challenge to evangelism. I know that in my life, my story has followed these different kinds of testimony. And like I said, I first came to know Jesus when I was young, when people told me about God. I was very blessed to be in a church when I was young. But as I got older, I made some other choices. Some things happened to me. I had some things that hurt me, and broke me up a little bit. And I spent a good chunk of my life there where I was angry at God. I, I, don't, I don't think I ever stopped believing that God existed, but I was not on good terms with God. I was very mad at God. I didn't trust God. I didn't trust that He loved me or that He would keep His promises because I had experienced the pain, and for some reason, I decided it was God's fault. Maybe you can relate to that. Well, that's part of my human testimony, but part of my human testimony is also to tell you about God's revelation. Because through that season, that season where I was so broken and angry, God never stopped chasing me. God sent person after person after person into my life to share hope. God spoke to me through the Bible, through devotions. That was the season in my life, believe it or not. I was the most angry at God, but I also started doing devotions the most faithfully that I ever had. I knew I needed something. I just couldn't figure it out. And I think I had this Holy Spirit in my heart whispering to me that this was the way to find it. This was the way to find my way out of the darkness. It's another kind of testimony, right? You see how these testimonies are all wrapped up? You're hearing my human testimony, but my human testimony is about God's revelation in my life. These things that John is talking about, that 1 John chapter 5 is talking about, they're all connected. The revelation of God in my life, the, the, the testimony and revelation of other people in my life, but also the revelation and testimony that I can give. 
You see, this, this gift, this, this blessing, this revelation, the, the story of Christmas, you could say, the Christmas gift, to put, you know, be a little on the nose, it's not a gift you were meant to keep. This morning in Sunday school, we're, you, you, I'm sure you've heard me talk about this, and I'm going to be talking about it a lot. It's a good series. It's called Experiencing God, and the theme of that series is much like what we're talking about today, this understanding that there's a difference between knowing about God and experiencing a relationship with God. And so this morning, we read from the book of Genesis and talked about Abraham. We talked about how God first called Abraham. Abraham was you know, a grown man. He was living with his family, working together as, as people often did back then. He was a, a you call him a shepherd or a herdsman. Um, and God spoke to Abraham and said, I want you to get up and leave and go somewhere else. I want you to leave your father. I want you to leave your family. And I want you to go. And at first, God doesn't even tell Abraham where to go. He just says, get up and leave. And Abraham, in an amazing demonstration of faith, does that. He gets up and he leaves. But there's a part of that conversation that always gets me in the heart. See, God talks about the blessings that he's going to give Abraham, but he also says that through Abraham, the whole world will be blessed. I think that's the origin of the phrase, blessed to be a blessing. Have you heard that before? Maybe you've seen it on a coffee mug or a poster. <laughs> blessed to be a blessing. I think that's how these pieces fit together for me, this, this passage from 1 John 5, that we are, we are given a revelation so that we can share a testimony. God works in our lives not just to offer you and I salvation. I mean, that's part of it, and that is a gift that's given. Grace, I want to say this right, it's a gift that is freely given that we can never earn and don't deserve. That's step one. But step two is the commission. Have you, uh, I don't know if any of you have served in the military or know people who have. Um, I have a friend who joined the Air Force uh, not long after we graduated college. And uh, he was given a commission. He was in medical school when he joined. And he was commissioned to be a doctor in the Air Force. And I didn't really know what that meant. You know, I had heard of commissioners, you know, like the people in county government, but to be given a commission, and, and I kind of checked into it a little bit, and you're basically, it's your job. <laughs> you're given a task. This is your title, but it's also your job description. You know, it's, you're given authority, but you're also given responsibility and, and work to do. That's your commission. Well, Jesus gave us a commission. Uh, we often call it the Great Commission. But he told us that we needed to share. He told us that the light that we received, that the gift that he had given us, it was not just meant for us to keep. It would be a pretty sad world if all these people, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and Samuel, and Elijah, and Isaiah, it would be pretty sad if all these people received their word from God and then just walked away and never shared it. It would be pretty rough, wouldn't it? When Jesus spoke, they weren't just empty words. When he gives his great commission, he has come back to the disciples, and he doesn't have much time with them. He knows that his ascension into heaven is coming, and this period of post-resurrection but pre-ascension, it's a short window. And I think we need to pay attention to the words that he chooses. So I want to I I connect the testimonies that we've heard about God's testimony, God's word, other people's testimony, God's personal revelation in our lives. I want to connect that in closing here to the Great Commission, to, to the job that we are given I'm going to be reading here from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, 
I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Did you notice that this commission starts and stops with Jesus? Jesus first says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Authority not just to give the commission, but authority to make sure it's carried out, to give us what we need to do it. That's where he closes. He closes with, and be sure of this, I am with you always. These are the bookends of the Great Commission. That Jesus has all authority on heaven and in earth. And that he promises to be with us always to the end of the road. That's the promise that we're given. So maybe you believe this. Maybe you don't. Maybe, maybe you think this is just a bunch of hogwash. Maybe you don't believe Jesus is real, or maybe you don't trust that God loves you. I don't know. If that's where you are, I, I pray that you keep searching. I pray that you keep searching for truth and for love and for God, because I, I think you'll find it. But maybe you're one who claims to follow Jesus. Maybe you're one who claims to believe this testimony that that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is our Lord, and that we're supposed to do what He says. If that's the case, I have a little bit of a different word for you. Don't confess with your mouth, but deny with your life. This great commission that we're given, it's not just about the words that we share. It's not just about what's on my t-shirt or my bumper sticker or on my Facebook, you know, that's not what this is. It's about my whole life. Does everything I do reflect Jesus? Is every area of my life under the authority of Jesus? Furman Rain said, probably a year and a half ago now, he said, if you invited Jesus over to your house, would you have a closet you wouldn't want him to look in? <laughs> Man, I think about that a lot. Do we have corners that we're holding back from Jesus? Do we have pieces that we don't want to give over to God's authority? These are good questions. And the reason I think they're so good and so important is because this isn't about just you and I. This isn't just about what happens to me. It's not whether I get 98% close to God or 97% close to God. That's not just what we're talking about here. It's not just about personal piety or your personal growth or your personal salvation. We've been given a commission. The human witnesses that we've talked about today, all these different people we've mentioned, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Samuel, Elijah, all these different people we've mentioned, they were witnesses. They were witnesses who received a message from God or had an experience with God and shared that. And because they did, the world was changed. Because they shared, other people received. And that's the same place we are called to be. We are called to have lives that are a testimony, that bear witness to God's power to change us. Your life as a Christian is your unspoken testimony. Your life, every choice you make, every word you speak, every place you go, these are all reflections of that truth. Verses 11 and 12 from 1 John 5. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Oh, well, that's a good word, right? But it doesn't stop there. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I pray that if you are in that second category, in that place where you don't know Jesus, that you'd ask him into your heart, that you'd ask him into your life, that you would seek out a relationship with him. And I pray that if you are in a place where you do call Jesus your Lord, where you have accepted his blood to wash you clean, that you would also accept his commission. 
that you would not just accept grace and salvation, but that you would also accept your calling. You know, I heard once that God doesn't call the equipped, that he equips the called. I think that's how it was with Abraham. When God called Abraham, he wasn't the man he ended up to be. And I think you can look at all the people in the Bible, whether it was Mary or Esther or Peter, you name them. They don't start out the people that God needs them to be. They start out just as people who say yes, and they follow. And because they do, amazing things happen. Think about Gideon. God finds Gideon hiding in a hole in the ground. And Gideon says, God, we need your help. You need to send somebody. And you know what God says to Gideon? God has a sense of humor. He says, okay, I send you. (laughs) And Gideon says, what? I'm just a farmer from a little tribe. I, I, I can't do any of this. But that's not the point, right? The point isn't what I have to say or what I can do. The point is what God has to say and what God can do. That's, that's what Christmas is about. That we were lost, unable to save ourselves, and God made it happen. And so I want to challenge you. If you have received something good this year from God, you know, as we're in this time between Christmas and New Year's, the time where we think back, if you have received anything good from God, a word, a blessing, a friendship, Pass it on, because you were blessed to be a blessing. Please join me in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this word. I thank you for this reminder that we have the testimonies of others and your divine revelation to lean on. Father, I thank you for your great commission. I thank you for trusting us with this task, even though we're not worthy. I thank you for equipping us to do the thing that you've called us to do And I thank you for working in our lives. Father, help us to share. Help us to take any good thing that you've given us or done for us or helped us to become and to share that with the world. Help us to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to sing a song again that we just sang, King of Kings. And uh, I really love it because it tells a story. If you're looking for words to share, this might be a good place to start. So please stand and join us as we sing King of Kings. In the darkness we were Without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died
of kings and the morning that you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me praise the father praise the son praise the spirit As you go today, go knowing that Jesus was born, that Jesus lived, that he died, that he rose again, that he shed his blood to save you, that you were given this blessing, not just so that you could be blessed, but so that you could share it with the world. You know the world is hurting, the world is broken, and the world is in darkness. And the only way out of that, the only solution, is through Jesus. So please tell somebody. As you go today, I want to speak the blessing from the Old Testament, from the book of Numbers. May God bless you and may God keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you. That means may he look at you and smile. May you go today in God's grace as God's children, working to redeem God's world. Go and be God's people. Amen. <laughs>